Good morning. Good morning. We're glad to see all of you. It's a, it's a new day, a new quarter, a new Sabbath for the month. Shall we bow our heads? Father, thank you for your many blessings, and we thank you for this quarter's lessons, and we pray for your blessing this morning. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Well, this morning we're starting a new quarter, and this quarter is going to be on the sanctuary. Amen. Now, the one doctrine that Adventists believe and share uh, that is peculiar is our sanctuary message. There are other groups that keep the Sabbath and there are those who believe in the Ten Commandments and you know various other things. But the one thing we have to share is the Sabbath school lesson. I mean is is <laughs> a sanctuary. <laughs> sanctuary service. Uh, this morning I thought since this is the first uh, of the quarter, uh, quarter um, first Sabbath of the quarter, I thought it might be good for us to uh, begin by thinking some of the practical elements of the uh, lessons for us. As we go through uh, we'll be able to learn more and more but but I thought I would share some things that have to do with present issues. Uh, but first of all, let's think about the sanctuary for a few minutes. Uh, the sanctuary dominates the Bible. Throughout the Bible, the sanctuary is a very important thing. Now, Right from the beginning in chapter 3 of uh, Exodus, we find that man sinned and there was a Savior. Immediately, uh, Christ made uh, clothes uh, of, of skins for, the, uh, for Adam and Eve. Genesis 3. And that is, that's right, and that... Um, that begins a ceremonial system right there. Now the clothes that he made were made from the skins of the animals that were slain. The first death that took place was right after sin and uh, it was Christ himself who slew the first animals and prepared these for for Adam and Eve. From that time on, there was a, a, a sanctuary system. Now, we didn't call it sanctuary, and it wasn't in a building, it, but they had an altar of sacrifice. And wherever Abraham went, he carried those, he, he, he uh, I should say, he uh, built those altars Wherever he stayed overnight, he built an altar, mm -hmm. and forever after that would remain there as a testimony to the worship of the true God. And Ellen White shows that from time to time, as uh, roving tribes or others came by, they would sometimes honor that um, uh, altar by worshiping there. But what is the purpose of a sanctuary? What is the meaning of a sanctuary? I would say the purpose of a meeting, uh, purpose of a sanctuary is a, is a place to meet with God, a dwelling place where God and man came. Uh, the sanctuary, the meaning of the sanctuary, first of all, the definition definitional meaning is a place of refuge, sanctuary. We, we use that word every now and then in various ways. It's a place of refuge. But the most important thing about... Is it a place of cleansing? Place of cleansing. Uh, but the most important thing, you've mentioned already, Joe, and by the way, this is Joe 
who uh, is visiting with us this morning. And uh, he has uh, uh, gone through our AVCO program, uh, get acquainted with him there. And, and I don't recall your name. Barry. Barry. <coughs> yeah, sure. Isn't it Psalm 77, 13 says, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them? I think 77, 13 says, thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Oh, yeah, yeah. But uh, we'll, we'll come to that again in, uh, in a moment. That's uh, Exodus 25. 25, 8. 25, 8, yes. <laughs> I let them make me a sanctuary that I may live amongst them, may dwell amongst them. Now, what you mentioned, Joe, to begin with about the meaning of sanctuary, a place to meet God, that is God's uh, a place of abode, actually, where, it, 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 uh, where God meets with man. And uh, uh, so the concept of sanctuary is very important. It has to do with the meeting place between sinful man and a sinless God. Mm -hmm. And God cannot behold iniquity. He cannot tolerate sin. There must be some medium by which God can come together with man without destroying him. The very uh, presence of God would destroy a sinner. Mm -hmm. And yet God wants to meet with us. Mm -hmm. And so he has designed a plan that, and did this long before man sinned. Mm -hmm. uh, but he designed a plan whereby he could meet with man without uh, any uh, problem of that kind, without destroying him, and the life-giving presence. So that instead of destroying man, he would be giving life. Mm -hmm. uh, when Christ uh, came, he became the sanctuary, mm -hmm. the temple. When he was here, he spoke to the, to the uh, leaders of his day and he said, you destroy this temple and three days I'll raise it up. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, they had no idea what he was talking about. And uh, later on at the crucifixion time of the uh, trial and so forth, they brought this up and they said he told them he was going to destroy the temple and build it in three days. Actually, he didn't say anything about destroying it at all, but he did say that he would raise it up. He said, you destroy, I'll raise up. Mm -hmm. But the temple that he was speaking about was his own body. And this leads us to something else. Before there was a sanctuary, there was a temple. Now, when we use the word sanctuary, we're usually talking about the wilderness dwelling of the tent. Uh, and the temple uh, was a magnificent structure and so forth. But uh, before there was a sanctuary, there was already a temple. God created man to be a temple for the Holy Spirit. Notice the meeting place. It was the Holy Spirit that was to abide within man's mind. And uh, that uh, meeting place, the mind of man, is the most important sanctuary. So God designed, in order to meet with man uh, and even with mind, it's necessary for there to be a sacrifice because sin brings what? Yeah, yeah. Well, but before death, what does it bring? Separation. Huh? Separation. separation. It brings separation, and what is the result of separation? Yeah. Well, that is death, yes. But what I'm wanting to say is that sin brings guilt, mm -hmm. and guilt separates and ultimately brings death. 
But the problem that God has is that the one who needs him the most runs away from him. The most. Yeah. Man is a sinner, needs God. He needs his presence. His problem is he's separated from God. He is made to be a temple of the Holy Spirit, but instead becomes a habitation of demons. The, see, when Satan uh, was able to separate Eve from God, he not only separated her from God, but he took over the, the plan of God uh, and, uh, and took God's place. So that, that uh, instead of God ruling man through the higher faculties, and I've, I've explained this a number of times, I think I'll put it on the board again. This is extremely important principle that, uh, uh-uh. This uh, comes out better sometimes and worse sometimes. Anyway, don't pay much attention to the... When God created man, he created him with a large cerebral cortex. He also created him with a lower animal center. All the animals have a... a, a uh, uh, what we call uh, um, thank you all animals have a brain of some kind but they all act on the basis of instinct they have a limited intelligence enough intelligence for them to to do whatever they need to do and, and uh, enough intelligence so we're amazed sometimes at what they can do. But what we're amazed at, usually a two-year-old could do better. <laughs> you know, right. it, it's not uh, nothing really phenomenal. Um, anyway, um, when God created man, he created him to be the abode of the Holy Spirit. Since sin entered the world, God has had to limit his contact with man and has operated largely through his word, but in the Holy Spirit and the word. There was a time when God would come personally and visit Adam and Eve, and they were delighted to have him come. But the time uh, when they, they uh, chose to sin, they separated themselves, they chose to separate themselves from the Spirit, which was to be their constant guide, and uh, they became afraid and they became guilty. When Adam and Eve heard God come walking in the garden right after they had sinned, what did they do? Run out to meet him? No, no. They ran, away. They ran to hide. They were guilty. Guilt is a very heavy thing to bear, and with it comes fear. And they ran to hide which is the first indication of separation between them and God. It was Eve and then Adam who chose to separate from the Holy Spirit. And separated from God, they could only be afraid of him. So here we have God wanting to come to a close to man. And the sanctuary is a sign of God's desire to be with us. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Mm -hmm. This was God's desire to dwell with his people. But the problem is that when he comes to speak to us and commune with us, 
we feel guilty and because of that we tend to withdraw. One of the most important lessons of the sanctuary is that when we are guilty, God wants us to come, not to run. He wants us to come to the sanctuary. The sanctuary is a visible representation of God's presence. And as a physical um, object that God desires people to come there. And when we come there, he takes away the guilt. But if we don't come there, there's no way to get rid of the guilt. The only way to get rid of the guilt is to come. But, but we are afraid to come, and well might we, because we have sinned against God and we are under the death penalty. So who wants to meet uh, death? You know, there, we always seek to preserve life. But when we know that Christ died for us, and that's what the sanctuary teaches us, the curtain and the outward, there are three curtains, the curtain uh, at the court, curtain at the holy place, the curtain before the most holy place, right from the beginning to enter that court, even the court is a holy place. And no one uh, would dare to come into that court without a sacrifice. The curtain represents Christ's body. Sacrifice represents Christ's body. An intense lesson that we need to come into God's presence, not just believing in Christ, but claiming him as our sacrifice. So as you enter the curtain, you come to the altar, a burnt offering. That offering, altar burnt offering is a symbol, of course, of, of the uh, sacrifice of Christ. It would be down here. A symbol of the sacrifice of Christ. Um, My mind wandered for a moment. Um, I, had, I was thinking of the fact that I started that sanctuary out wrong, Sister Karen, because uh, directions are not correct. But, but at any rate, uh, the uh, this is east, but uh, that should be north. It, this, this uh, yeah. This should be north, this should be, yes, this should be east. The reason why it's very important is because there's a very important lesson in the design of the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. The sun soon became the heathen symbol of life and of creator. Creation. And so when the sun comes up, what happens to the, to the plants? In the wintertime, we have very little sun and no vegetation. In the spring, the sun warms up, warms the air. First thing you know, the flowers and the, everything buds and, and blooms. And so the heathen began to worship the sun rather than Christ. And so the sanctuary was designed in such a way that when the worshipers came to the sanctuary, they would have their backs to the sun, their faces to the sanctuary. Amen. And uh, I'm not sure why I fixed it the way I did it to start with, uh, Karen. But anyway, the worshipers never faced the sun always faced away from it. And yet we have Easter sunrise services where they purposely worship the sun, uh, face the sun, which is a symbol of worshiping uh, the sun, uh, S-U-N. 
So here we have the 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 uh, plan of God is that the sinners who, by the way, the tents were arranged all the way around the sanctuary, but the closest tent would be about a kilometer away, about two thirds of a mile, which is quite a distance. So you have the court, uh, you have the sanctuary, you have the court, which I didn't draw and we don't have the room to do. But anyway, then you have the court and then you have a, a, a quarter of a mile, I mean a, a, a kilometer between and that kilometer has a purpose. God's people, even the God's people are still a long ways from, from, from God and that we need to be constantly coming. But we cannot come too close to him because of our condition. And so we must learn to reverence God. We worship him at a distance, even though he comes and wants to be near us and wants to be with us. We ourselves uh, are unfit to enter into his presence. And when a person did come to the sanctuary, it would only be when they were coming with a, with a lamb or a, with a symbol of the sacrifice of Christ. And they would have to cross that kilometer individually testifying all the way that they had sinned. And that... Uh, so everyone that, in the camp knew it. Then. Pardon? Everyone in the camp knew it. Everyone in the camp knew it, yeah. And they were to do it. So that when, when they came with their a sacrifice, it was not just a simple stepping next door. It was a matter of, of uh, a, a very uh, significant journey. And these are all symbols to help us to realize, number one, that uh, what we have, as far as the sanctuary is concerned, we have the most holy place. And then we have the holy place. And there's a degrees uh, of approach here. So then we have the court, which is not shown here, but the court. And outside the court, another, another kilometer, which shows uh, the holiness of God and the importance uh, of preparation to, to meet with him. Now, God did not want to separate man from him. Man was separated. But God built the sanctuary in such a way that there would be symbols of separation that man should recognize and cause him to be more reverent and more uh, uh, recognize the holiness of God. And by the way, that reverent, that name, or uh, that word reverent should never be used in, in terms of human beings. Holy and reverend is his name. And in this day and age, they tend to call ministers reverend. Uh, no minister should ever permit the title reverend to be attached to his name. And no one should certainly use that name. That name, that uh, term belongs to God. Holy and reverent is even his very name because the name stands for the person. So everything about the sanctuary tells us two things. Well, there's more than two things, but the whole sanctuary design uh, uh, tells us the holiness of God and the separation of man from God and the unholiness of man and the need for Christ to bring a holy God and an unholy people together. So a Christ is the great mediator and visibly God gave us a representation of how it is that we are to come into his presence. 
first of all, reverently. And secondly, with the lamb. That is, Christ was symbolized by other sacrifices as well. But when we speak of Christ, we usually speak of him as the lamb, not the goat. You know what I mean? The goats were used in that way. Bullocks were used. But uh, the sinner could only come by bringing his own sacrifice. And when the sinner came into the courtyard and was there before the altar, there was a stake there. That animal that he had to be tied to that stake and the sinner himself would take the knife and slay the lamb. Christ slew the first sacrifice. That was a symbol of his own death. It was a symbol of the fact that he would give his own life it would not be taken from him. He would give it himself. Mm -hmm. Christ the sacrifice, Christ the priest. As a, as a priest, Christ slew the first sacrifice, which is a symbol of himself. And uh, then uh, as, a, as a sinner, man then would have to do that because although Christ gave himself, he said, no man takes my life from me. I give it, I lay it down myself. Didn't he also say he has the power to raise it up again? I have the power to lay my life down and the power to raise it up again. Yeah. yeah. So uh, three things then, especially that the whole sanctuary uh, indicates is the holiness of God, the sinfulness of man, and the mediator, the one who brings those together. And of course, as we begin with, it also symbolizes the separation and, and communion, both. Mm -hmm. Let them make me a sanctuary. I want you to de design a sanctuary, God says, a place where you can come and have special fellowship with me. I want to dwell among you. Amen. But I can't dwell among you because you're unclean. Uh, I, I've, I, I can only be with you under circumstances in which you acknowledge and recognize my holiness. God's holiness. When Christ and his Father come the second time, the Bible shows that the sinners will, uh, will um, perish by the very presence, by his very presence will this be destructive to the sinners. Why? Christ will be there, isn't he the mediator? Well, he is the mediator now, but he won't be then. That's right. Mm -hmm. He's coming back in soon. As the, when the wicked cry out, they cry out for protection from the wrath of the Lamb. The wrath of God and of the Lamb. But it's the wrath of the Lamb that is the most to be feared because if the, but the lamb is the only uh, safeguard. The lamb is the only security. The lamb is the only way that we can enter into the presence of God without being slain by his brightness. Yeah, that we could be slain with the brightness coming. I was trying to say that a while ago and wasn't able to get it. At any rate, uh, the sanctuary then shows how sinful, unholy human beings, unclean, can enter into the presence of a holy God. And uh, if we only recognize the holiness of God uh, more, our churches would be much more uh, reverent. 
uh, God intends for us to learn to be reverent. We cannot be truly reverent until we really sense the presence of God. And the problem of irreverence in the church is that as people forget that God is present. And we need to also remember that for God to be present, there must be a mediator, Christ. And as long as Christ continues as our mediator, then we have, we're able to be in his presence. But if we sensed for a moment the holiness of God and could sense our own uncleanness, we would be so stricken with a sense of urgency for a mediator and for the need for reverence. I, I, I've read it somewhere. It says, the closer we get to Christ, the more filthy uh, that You'll find that in Steps to Christ, but you'll also find it, I think, in Christ's Object Lessons. But uh, the closer we come to Christ, the more clearly we shall see the defects of a character. And I believe that may be page 47. It, it is the next to the last page in chapter 7. Uh, and so, but yes, that's a very important thing to understand. So the sanctuary then is not just merely something to memorize or, or, or learn different things, but to throughout we need to remember that the most important things about the sanctuary have to do with man's condition and God's greatness of character, God's holiness, and the fact that man's filthiness. Now, the fact is that when we, we all, no matter how close we come to Christ, we still have a clearer, we will have clearer insight into our defects. But Ellen White says, even our prayers and our praises have to be cleansed by the, the, the incense, I think she's talking about. And, and one other thing that, uh, this is Hebrews 4, chapter 15, 16, it says, For we have not a high priest, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. <coughs> Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. You know, and I, I, I talk to some people sometimes, and, oh yeah, we go boldly, boldly. Well, it's boldly to what throne? The throne of grace, yeah. right? Yeah. It says that we may obtain mercy, because we need mercy, uh, yes. and find grace to help in time of need. Right. So, so what we need is mercy and grace, and the throne that it's speaking about is Christ's sanctuary. Amen. This morning, uh, let's see what time, how much time we have. Only a few minutes. I had thought maybe... Uh, Hopefully, you've had a chance to read the passages, in, especially in Revelation, uh, but throughout the Bible on the sanctuary. But I thought maybe, um, by the way, this needs to be... Uh, uh, but I had thought maybe I might talk a little bit about, uh, about issues that we face relating to the sanctuary. Uh, we have been challenged, we will be challenged from now until the end uh, by those who deny the reality of the heavenly sanctuary. Um, the fact is that, oh, I better erase this. The fact is that we have, uh, God has given us a beautiful message that has to do with the judgment hour. And uh, 
has to do with justification. You see, when, when Israel came to the sanctuary, they came for the purpose of receiving, of transferring their guilt. The sinner would come to the sanctuary with his sacrifice. He would confess his sins. Then the lamb had to have his neck slit and the blood then had to be administered. All of this was symbolic of justification. The transfer of guilt from the sinner to Christ. Now, the issue of justification as it relates to the sanctuary is very important. Um, we, the evangelical world today, insists that justification took place at the cross, that we're all justified at the cross. Des Ford brought this into Adventism, and of course it's been a subject of discussion. But I want to discuss this in relation to the sanctuary. Justification, they say, represents uh, what happened at the cross. I had the privilege of dealing with Desmond Ford's views in my doctoral dissertation. And his whole focus is on justification and justification having taken place at the cross. What do you suppose is the reason why they stress that justification took place 2,000 years ago at the cross? What do you suppose is the reason? People don't want to transfer their sin now. Yes, and the fact is theologically, personally that's true, but theologically, it is a way of denying the sanctuary in heaven. You see, we were, according to this view, we were justified at the cross, and that's it. That's the complete work of salvation. Actually, that was the beginning of the work of salvation. In the ancient sanctuary, the, the altar only permitted them to move further into God's presence. Mm -hmm. Until sin and guilt are dealt with, we cannot enter into God's presence. Mm -hmm. Now, where were you in 31 AD? <laughs> what decisions did you make? How were you able to, to choose Christ? You see, the fact is that justification involves and requires a choice. Do I want to transfer my guilt to Christ and claim his righteousness? It's a very personal thing. Do I want to enter <clears throat> into the presence of God or do I want to remain separated? Now, those who claim that we were justified at the cross. First of all, deny the reality of the exercise of the will. Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. Here he is an adult, has not yet made that decision for himself. He has assumed that he was righteous. In order for him to become righteous, he must first take his sin and deliver it to Christ. And so it is that we have to be born again. There is no way to enter into God's presence otherwise. Mm -hmm. And we do so by way of the lamb, by the sacrifice of Christ. So when we receive the sa sacrifice of Christ, we are then, uh, he removes our guilt, takes it upon himself, and gives us his assurance of righteousness. And we must believe that because according to your faith, be it unto you. 
When I was a boy, seven years old, I committed what Satan tried to make me believe was the unpardonable sin. For eight years, I struggled to try to prove to God that I was uh, good enough to be saved. Uh, but that was impossible. I finally came to the place where I recognized there was nothing I could do, absolutely nothing I could do to make myself acceptable to God. And at that point, I was prepared to transfer my guilt to one who was able to take it, Christ. He had already died for me so that he could take my sin and give me his righteousness. And that experience of conversion was the most thrilling experience. I was in a, I was living in a, in a haymow of the old haymow of the, an old horse barn, long since used for that. But uh, I was taking care of the dairy for this man. But anyway, when this, when I broke through and found myself in the presence of God and that he had received me, this was the most wonderful experience. I had to sing in the, uh, up there in the old horse barn. No one to sing to, but I had to sing praises to God. Amen. The presence of God, in the presence of God, there is joy. Out of the presence of God, there is fear and despair and all kinds of worries. So, but it is the sanctuary that teaches us the process by which we, the sinner, can come to God and to exchange. Now, there was no exchange for my sins at the cross. There was an action on the part of Christ to take care of all sin, including mine, but there was no reception there. I was not there to receive it. I had no choice. Choose ye this day. And uh, so the choice is so important. The other thing is that the purpose of those who claim that the atonement took place only at the cross and, and everything was done at the cross is to deny the judgment. And I think you mentioned something about that, Karen. Um, if I was justified at the cross, and if that's all there is to justification, then that would mean that, uh, well, everybody would normally mean that everybody's saved. But of course they claim, well, you have to acknowledge that. Uh, and so that would be, but the fact is that it, it denies the judgment. When I dealt with Desmond Ford, he was dealing not with the sanctuary, but with justification. But in my manuscript, by May of 80, I think that was, by the time I finished that part, I had included in it where Des was going. If you insist on justification taking place at the cross, you're denying the judgment. The future judgment. The future judgment. Because if it all happened there, there would be no place for a judgment. The fact is justification is real and it's not just temporary, but it is still based on a completion of this journey to God's presence. If I come so far to, into God's presence and then decide to, to do my own thing for a while, I leave his presence. When we become Christians, converted, if we begin to become careless and and do things that would separate us from God, we are separated from God. But uh, the fact is 
that God earnestly desires us to be in his presence. He cannot be with us except through Christ. But the time will come when the judgment will be complete and Christ will have put a seal upon us, his own seal of character. And this is the sealing time where my, our minds and our hearts must be transformed. And when the close of probation, he will declare, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. No, no further opportunity. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, only holy people can enter into the presence of a holy God. He that is holy will always remain holy. Now, but that is after the judgment. And a judgment is a part of the whole justification process. Indeed, it is the exclamation mark at the end of justification, where that justification uh, is never threatened again by our own choice because we have already so fully made choices for him that there's no possibility of our making a different choice. Now, there is still a technical possibility because we still have power of choice. So throughout, throughout eternity, there's a technical possibility because we will be free, but there's no real possibility because we will have so learned the, the terror of sin and the joy of, of the presence of God that we would never, ever do such. Just and like Jesus would never sin, although he could. Yeah, but, the, but this is one of the issues that Ellen White had to deal with. Many said he couldn't have sinned. No, oh, yes, she said, could have sinned. But he didn't. Mm -hmm. And uh, it wouldn't have been true temptation. Pardon? Otherwise. It wouldn't have been a true temptation otherwise. That's right. It would not have been. Yeah. Yes. I think I heard the first bell, and it's probable that there's a second bell. I didn't hear it. I think they're late. What time is it? Well, there's no, there's no head oh. today, so you're probably. At any rate, I'd like to close by this. God has given us a precious message. Satan hates that message. He will do everything he can to destroy our confidence in it. But remember, the sanctuary, the design of the sanctuary is that God may meet with us. The purpose of the sanctuary is to bring us close together, sinners, into God's presence in a secure manner. So the word sanctuary means security. In secure manner. And that it will it be the that is the key to all our fears, our worries, uh, and so forth, so that there is no one so joyous as the Christian. There's no one so free as the Christian. Shall we bow our heads? Thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. Thank you for this privilege of being together and studying your word and your plan, your sanctuary. In the name of Jesus, amen.